It's a clip from The Perfect Storm. And they find themselves in this crab boat out in the middle of this perfect storm, these huge waves that are coming up. And some of you have seen that. And they, they try everything that they can to escape the storm. And they, they, they've used every idea that they can think of. And so now they've got one last ditch effort to, to escape the storm. They're going to try one more thing. And if that doesn't work, then what are they going to do? Did you catch it? Then we pray. Wow, what a great illustration of what prayer is for many of us. I mean, we're going to try everything else that we can think of. We're going to do, we're going to do everything in our power. We're going, to, we're going to come up with the best solutions that we can possibly find. We're going to try all of our ideas out as far as we can go. And, and then, if, it, then if, it, if we get desperate, if we, if we have to go to our last resort, if we need a Hail Mary pass at the end of the game where you know, it seems like lost, let's just chuck something up, then we pray. What a great illustration of what prayer is for many of us. It's a last resort, an act of desperation, a Hail Mary pass. And, and so many of us, we, we do what the, the men on the boat did in the perfect storm. We get ourselves in this horrible predicament. We get ourselves, because of multiple bad decisions that we make from the very beginning, we find ourselves over here in a desperate situation, and then we cry out to God, God, save us! And if God doesn't immediately save us and get us out of our desperate situation, then we get angry at God because of what God didn't do for us. And the reason we're here is because prayer for us is a last resort. It's what we do when everything else falls apart. But if this is what prayer is for us, we will never live life at the next level. It has to become something more if our life is ever going to soar. Let me pray. Gracious God, I thank you. Lord, I thank you that, uh, that you call us into this place today. Lord, you called us here because you want to speak to us, because you want to offer us a uh, uh, a wisdom that causes us to live up. Lord, you desire for your people uh, to live life the next level so that your name might be uh, reverenced throughout the land. And so, Lord, we just pray that you'd open up our hearts and minds to hear the message that you would speak to us today from your scriptures. Uh, Lord, uh, use whatever you need to today. We're at your disposal, Lord. Just, just use us in some way, uh, Father, to, to further your kingdom and, and speak to us in a way so that when we walk out of here, we'll be a people who are changed. Lord, I thank you for all the dads here, uh, for, for what they mean to their families. Uh, Lord, I thank you for the tremendous power of a father. And, and I pray this especially for the fathers, Lord, that you would open up their eyes today, that they might, that they might hear this message, uh, and that prayer might be something more uh, than a last resort. Father, we love you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. We're, we're in the third week of a series uh, called uh, Sky, Life at the Next Level. And we've been looking at what it takes for us as Christians to live life at the next level. In the first week, we looked at the life of Peter. And we saw that, that Peter had to come to an understanding that he was not the hero of the story if his life was going to soar. He had to understand that it was his own strength, his own determination that was going to win the day. It was becoming humble before Christ and just accepting that in the Bible there's only one hero in the story. And so it began with humility. Last week, Kathleen spoke to you about another important step on experiencing that life to the next level, and that's to realize that God calls us to a selfless life, not to a selfish life. And, and she used the illustration of Christ to show us that Christ was on mission, and he understood he was here to bless and to serve somebody else. And listen, until you get that, your life's never going to soar. As long as it's about you, you're never going to experience the fullness of the life that God wants to give to you until you understand that he's calling you to give your life away so that others might experience life itself. This week, we're going to look at Joshua. Now, I think Joshua is a great, uh, great story, has a great message for us today about what it takes to live life at the next level. I want to catch you up on where we are in the story because we're going to start at Joshua chapter 5, but you kind of got to understand something about what was going on in the story before we get to here. Joshua was leading the people into the promised land. 
uh, and, and God had given them the promised land, there was just one big problem with the promised land, and that was it was occupied by other people. And one of the first obstacles they faced to entering the promised land and making it their own was the city of Jericho. Jericho was a tremendous fortress of a city. Surrounding Jericho was a wall that was 40 feet tall and 6 feet thick. Around that outside wall, would, it would be lined by soldiers. 15 feet inside from the outer wall was another wall. It was 40 feet tall and 6 feet thick. Lined around the top of that wall were also soldiers. Inside the city were great storage tanks for grain and water. This was a city that was set up uh, to withstand a siege. And this is what Joshua is going to go up against. And, and before he can get to the city, though, he faces another obstacle. And that's the Jordan River. Jericho's on one side of the Jordan River. They're on the other side of the Jordan River. And the problem is, is that the Jordan River is at flood stage. And there's no way that they can cross it. Well, there doesn't seem to be any way they can cross it. And in chapters 3 and 4 of Joshua, we see that God miraculously parts the Jordan River. And the people walk across dry land. And it says that, that when, they, when, the, when the people of the land saw that the Israelites crossed the, the, the Jordan on dry ground, that they were astounded and in fear of God, and that they're all fleeing and running. And the Israelites, now they've snuck up on Jericho because the people in Jericho thought they were safe for a little while. While the Jordan was at flood stage, nobody could cross the river. They were safe. Now the Israelites, they've, they've pulled a surprise on them. They've crossed across the river. They've walked across on dry land. Now they can sneak up on the city of Jericho. And this this is an awesome moment because think how, think how those soldiers were feeling. Think how pumped up they were when they walked across the Jordan on dry ground. I mean, if you want your soldiers pumped up for a war, I mean, listen, let them experience a miracle like this. And you can just imagine that, that when they walked across that river that they were just made, yes, yes, man, God dried up the ground. Even though there's a fortune, man, we can do this. I mean, and now, now is an opportunity for Joshua to pump his men up to say, let's take the city. I mean, if you've seen Braveheart, you know the moment it had to feel like. I mean, it was just one of those moments when you've got the people together. They're ready. They're fired up. They're pumped up. Let's go take the city. That's what I would have done. I mean, because you, know, you had this great moment. Everybody's running around in fear. Jericho's in surprise. Your men are pumped up. Man, let's do this thing. Well, that's not what happens here. Let's, let's read the scripture. Uh, Joshua chapter 5, beginning in verse 2. It says, At that time the Lord said to Joshua, Now they've crossed over the river. They're now in the promised land. They're facing Jericho. At that time the Lord said to Joshua, Make flint knives and circumcise the Israelites again. So Joshua made flint knives and circumcised the Israelites at Gibeath Haraloth. All right, I'm going to be honest with you. That wouldn't be my plan. <laughs> I mean, your men have crossed the river. They're all excited. Man, you got to know they're, they're pumped up. And, and you get across the river, and they're ready to go. And you say, hey, guys, here's what we're going to do. We're going to circumcise everybody with flint knives. <laughs> no, it's not the same as let's go. I mean, that would feel better to me. And yet that's what they do, and they, they, they circumcise the guys, and, and, and not only do they circumcise them, but after you're circumcised, it's not like you put back on your battle gear and, and, and step back off into line. I mean, there's a healing process that has to take place here. And so now they've crossed across the river. They're, they're on the way to Jericho. The people are hearing about this. They've lost their moment of advantage because now they've got to sit around for a few days and heal. And they celebrate the Passover. And I want to tell you, that's not the way I would have done it. And if that sounds strange, man, the rest of the story is even stranger. And some of you kind of remember about Joshua and the battle of Jericho. But it gets even stranger in chapter 6. It says in chapter 6, now they, they've all been circumcised and, and they've celebrated the Passover, they've healed up, and, and now we come to chapter 6. It says, now Jericho was tightly shut up because of the Israelites. No one went out and no one came in. Then the Lord said to Joshua, see I have delivered Jericho into your hands, along with its king and its, and its fighting men. March around the city once with all the armed men. Do this for six days. Have seven priests carry trumpets of ram's horns in front of the ark. On the seventh day, march around the city seven times with the priests blowing the trumpets. When you hear them sound a long blast on the trumpet, have all the people give a loud shout. Then the wall of the city will collapse and the people will go up, every man straight in. Now, some of you have heard this story before. 
And for those of you who heard the story before, man, you, you don't get it because you go, okay, you know, that's what they did. That's how the story goes. Listen, that's a crazy idea. Uh, you know, and can you imagine Joshua hearing this for the first time? I mean, he, he goes to the Lord and says, all right, God, what are we going to do now? We're ready to attack Jericho. And, and he says, man, are we going to build battle rams? Are we going to tunnel under there? Are we going to catapult people over the wall? I mean, we're going to build ropes. I mean, how are we going to do this, God? And God says, here's what we're going to do, Joshua. You're going to march around the city for six days, once a day. On the seventh day, you're going to march around seven times. On the seventh time, you're going to blow your horns. The walls are going to fall down. I'm going to give you the city. Joshua goes, what are you talking about, Willis? I mean, it's one of those moments. And we, we don't get it because we've heard the story over and over again. But Joshua had to go, man, that wasn't his plan. That was a crazy idea. That was not the way it was done at all. And yet here was God telling him to do it this kind of crazy way that God had planned. And, and it, it didn't sound like a good idea. But if you know the story, you know what happens next. They walk around the city for six days. They walk around once. On the seventh day, they walk around seven times. And they blow their trumpets. And the walls fall down. And they take over Jericho. Not the way I would have done it. I don't think it was the way Joshua would have done it. I'm pretty sure it wasn't the way that you would have done it. But, but here's the deal. Joshua experienced a victory because he brought prayer to the front end of his problem. You see that? I mean, before, before he attacked Jericho, he has these conversations with God. We call that prayer. And he sits down with God and God says, well, the first thing I just don't want you to circumcise everybody. And I thought that would have been his plan. But he goes, okay, God, if you say so, I'll be obedient to them. Then he's, when it's time to attack the city, God says, here's what you're going to do. And, and Joshua says, well, that's not the way I had planned to do it. But God, if that's what you want, that's the way we'll do it. And so he experienced victory because he brought prayer to the front end of his problems. For Joshua, prayer was not an act of desperation. For him, prayer was not the last resort after he had tried everything else in his arsenal. For him, prayer was not a Hail Mary pass. For Joshua, prayer was an opportunity to line up his will with God's will. And because he did this, he experienced this tremendous victory that was not due to the strength of his men, it was not due to Joshua's strategic mind. It was not due to the weakness of Jericho, the weakness of the walls, or the weakness of the people inside there. It was a tremendous fortress. It was simply because Joshua chose to listen to God on the front end. And when he listened to God on the front end, God gave him a way in which he experienced a great victory. And the scripture says, no, did Joshua experience a great victory, but through his victory... The awe and fear of the Lord spread across the land. The awe and the fear of the Lord spread across the land. Because Joshua chose to bring prayer to the front end of his problems. You know, a lot of us, a lot of us, I, I think, have come to know God as our rescuer. A lot of us have come to know God as our comforter in times of pain and grief. And lots of times when we hear stories in the church and people share their testimonies, I mean, that's what we hear people share is, is how they were down and they were in this horrible situation and God came and, and rescued them out of it or, or how they were in the midst of this pain and grief and God came and, and he gave them some comfort, man. And that's great. But one of the reasons that I think that so many of us have, have come to know God as rescuer and comforter is because we keep making stupid decisions. We keep making decisions without prayer, without consulting God on the front end, and we keep finding ourselves over here saying, God, come rescue me. I mean, I'm, here I am. I'm, I just need your help, and, and come rescue me now because I've put myself in this really desperate situation, and I've tried everything else I can try, and now I need you to come and to rescue me from the mess of my own making. And thank God that God is our rescuer and that God is our comforter. And that God is a God of grace and love because when we cry out to God, God comes to his people. But don't you know that God occasionally wants to say, you're there because you made a bunch of stupid decisions. And if you had talked to me over here, you never would have been there. And I praise God that we know him as our rescuer and our, as our comforter. But I also want us to know him as a mighty king. As a one who leads his people to victory. As the God who grants his children success. But if we're ever going to experience that God in our life, we have to bring prayer to the front end of our problems. Before we even know that there are any problems. Instead of crying out to God over here when our relationship has totally broken down and saying, God, come save my broken relationship. How about we begin with prayer before we enter into a new relationship? 
How about when we enter into that relationship, we simply say, God, would you show me how to be in relationship with this person? I mean, I've got my ideas about what I ought to do, and I know what the world says I ought to do and how this ought to work, but would you show me your way and just let me kind of follow you into this from the very beginning? Before we cry out over here because our kids are all going crazy at college and doing crazy stuff, how about over here when our children are conceived, we say, God, will you teach me how to raise my children in a godly way? I mean, as they're growing up, God, would you teach me how to raise them according to, to your wisdom? And I know how the world raises their kids. I know how I was raised by my parents. But would you teach me to do it your way from the very beginning? Before we're over here and our business is going under and we're, and we're about to sign the bankruptcy papers and we're saying, God, come save my business because everything's all going horrible and all these kinds of things. How about over here we say, God, man, would you, would you come in and be in the midst of my business? I know how my business professor said I ought to run my business. I know how my dad said I ought to run my business. I know how I think I I ought to run my business, but God, would you come on the front end and teach me your way? What would happen if we brought prayer to the front end of life and made it not an act of desperation, not a Hail Mary pass, not a last resort, but a way of life, of simply living with God, of lining up our plans with his plans so that we could experience victories that God alone could achieve, so that God's name would be spread across land so that our whole community and church and nation would stand in fear and awe of God who brings victory to his people. So we've got to understand very clearly what Isaiah uh, was trying to say. God was saying through Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 55, verses 8 through 9. Uh, God spoke these words to the people. He said, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Through Isaiah, God is reminding the people of something very simple. God says, I know more than you. And that's what he's trying to say through Isaiah, because the people are trying to go about their own way and do things their own way. And God simply says, hey, listen, I want to remind you that you're not God. I want to remind you that I know things that you don't know, and my ways are not always your ways. And he says, seek me. Seek my wisdom. Seek my ways. And we have to be reminded of that. It's crazy that we have to be reminded. Isn't it crazy that we have to be reminded that God knows more than us? But the truth is that we do. Because we tend to go off and make decisions. We tend to go off and make decisions about relationships, about finances, about business, about all sorts of things without ever praying about it. Without ever talking to God about it. You do that sometimes? Because you know what? We do it because we know how to handle this. I know how to repair my relationships. I know how to raise my kids. I know how to run my business. And if I'm not careful, I can begin to think that I'm the hero of the story. I know how to handle this. And so remembering, you know what? I, I, I don't know how to do all these things. God's got to work through me. I, I've got to realize there's only one hero to the story. And I've got to continually remind myself that God's ways are not my ways. And if I don't listen to him and communicate with him, I'm going to miss a chance for a great victory in, in, in life. His ways are higher than mine. I was praying uh, one morning before worship a few years ago, uh, and I was just praying it before worship. I was praying, God, would you just have your way with our worship service today? And just, God, whatever you want to do, just kind of let it happen. And that's a dangerous prayer to pray. And, and on this particular morning, I, I was praying that, and and, and I felt like God told me to, to wash Kathy's feet. Kathy was a lady in our church. Uh, we were in a series on marriage. And whenever you do a series on marriage, you know, it brings up lots of issues that so many people have struggled with. And uh, Kathy had been divorced and experienced some, some pain in her relationships. And she had shared her story with the congregation previous to this. And, and so as we were going through this series, I just felt God that morning say, wash Kathy's feet. And I thought, really, God, that I got a really good sermon. That's really not what, you know, I've, I've got to straighten everybody out with my sermon. I, I really don't want to wash Kathy's feet, though I think it's a biblical thing. It's kind of an awkward thing to do. You know how that is. But I felt God kind of put that on me. And so I, I thought to myself, you know what I'll do? I'll put a bowl of water under my chair. So in case, not up here in front where people can see it and ask what it's for. I'm just going to put a bowl of water under my chair. So if God kind of confirms to me I'm supposed to do this during worship, then I'll have the water available. But I'm not going to put it up front yet. And so I, I did that. I put the bowl of water under my chair, and I thought, maybe Kathy won't come to church today. And so we're singing our songs, kind of like we do here, and it's about the second song, and I look back, I don't see Kathy anywhere. I'm, all right, I'm not supposed to do it. 
And uh, about the end of that second song, I look back and see Kathy there. I'm like, oh, man, she's at church. I'm singing. I'm thinking, God, come on now. And then I, I thought, you know what? I have this revelation. If she has on pantyhose, I can't wash her feet. <laughs> and so I walked back to where Kathy was, and, 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 I, and I stood beside her, and I said, Kathy, do you have on pantyhose? <laughs> Which is probably a funny question to be asked by your pastor during worship. But I said, do you have on pantyhose? She said, uh, she said no, I got on socks. <laughs> I said, all right. I said, uh, I'm supposed to wash your feet today. She said, what? supposed to wash your feet today. She said, really? I said, yeah, I think so. She said, okay. So uh, when it was my turn to come up here, I, I brought my little bowl of water up and brought Kathy up and, and just uh, talked about what a blessing she was and about God's grace and, 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 and um, all sorts of stuff. And I, I washed her feet. And I want to tell you, God did an amazing work through that moment. Uh, wasn't my idea, wasn't my plan, but in that moment, God brought some healing to some people it was a tremendous moment in the life of our church, a, a growth moment that, that God just used that in ways that I never could have expected or seen. And, and, and I just praise God that, that on that morning at least, I, I got it right. And my part in getting it right was saying, God, what do you want me to do? My part in getting it right, I, I'm not the hero of that story. I didn't want to do it. It wasn't my idea. Uh, my part in that story was simply saying, God, what do you want to do today? And, and I'll, I'll do what you ask me to do. He's the hero of that story. And that's just one time when I can tell you lots of times when I didn't get it right, when I didn't ask and, and suffered. But that one time, I said, God, what do you want to do? And God showed me. And God blessed the church in that moment. And what do you think would have happened this week if, if we just brought prayer to the front end of life? If we just, before we go to work tomorrow, just said, God, I don't, I don't know what you want to happen today, but I just want you to know if there's something you want me to do, I'll do it. I'm just, I'm yours today. Just use me in, in, in some way. God, as I, as I relate to my wife this week, God, just, I know I have all sorts of ideas about what it means to be a husband, but would you teach me? No, I've got all sorts of ideas about what it means to be a dad. Would you teach me this week what that means again? Would you just, would you just humble me so that I realize that I need you to show me what is true and right and good? I don't want to wait till I'm in a desperate situation. I don't want to wait till I'm panicked. I don't want to wait till there's no hope. I don't want to throw up a Hail Mary. I just want to start with you in the beginning, God. Start with you in the beginning. Man, I believe that if we would do that, if we would bring prayer to the front end of our problems, that God would work in amazing and mighty ways. That we would see walls come down. We would see relationships repaired. That, that God's name would be lifted up throughout our community because God would be doing what God alone could do. And when it happens, we would know that it's not me. It wasn't my idea. It wasn't my plan. It was God. We would give glory where glory belongs. What is prayer for you? What is prayer for you? Don't let it be an act of desperation. Don't let it be a Hail Mary pass. Let's bring it to the front then. And then we'll experience life at the next level. Let me pray. Gracious God, I thank you. I thank you for your great mercy and grace. Lord, no matter how many times we put ourselves in that desperate situation, no matter how many times we have ignored you until that moment of panic, Lord, you have loved us. And you've responded. You've picked us up. You've dusted us off. You've given us hope and you've given us life, and we thank you for that. But Lord, I pray that today that we would not know you simply as a God who rescues, simply as a God who comforts us in our times of grief. I pray that we would come to know you as a mighty king. Lord, I pray that we would come to know you as the Lord of lords. Lord, I pray that we would come to know you as the one who grants success, the one who leads us into battle victoriously. God, I pray that you would teach us simply to trust you at each moment on the front end of our day, on the front end of our problems. Lord, before we know there are any problems, let us simply lay down our life before you that we might experience the victories that belong only to you. Lord, when it happens, we want to give you all the glory. We want to just point towards you, Father, because we know that you are the source of every good gift, the source of all good things. You are the person who changes hearts and lives. Uh, Lord, and we just thank you. Thank you for the, for the privilege that we have 
boldly approaching the throne of grace in prayer. We thank you that you answer prayers. We thank you that you're speaking to us. Uh, We thank you that you're surrounding us with Christians who will direct us again and again onto a right path. We thank you for your word, which gives direction to our our lives. Lord, we just praise you for all these things. Lord, Lord, what you did with Joshua and bringing down those walls. Lord, do it again with us. The walls we face may not be a physical wall, but you know the obstacles and the challenges we face. And what you have done before, Father, we absolutely know that you can do again. And we ask that you would do it in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior. Jesus Christ. Amen.